Welcome to the Stepmom Side with Alicia Crasco, the podcast for stepmoms ready to create the life they want and one they actually have a say in. Here we talk all things stepmom life and just a little bit more. Leave the superficial conversations at the door and get ready for perspective shifts and actionable advice to help you on your way to creating the life you want. One step at a time. Hi, Krista. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to chat with you. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm always excited when anyone wants to talk about grief. <laughs> yeah. When I was like, when I got your podcast pitch, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Like I've been talking about this in coaching recently, just like grief of different things. And so yeah. I was like, yes, let's talk about this. So my audience may or may not know you. Can you tell us a little bit about you? What's your elevator pitch? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the grief coach that never really intended to be a grief coach kind of story. So I, you know, wasn't a, a lifelong interest for me, but when I was 40, I had remarried my first marriage while it resulted in two amazing children, you know, did not end very well. And the second marriage was like the redemption story of, you know, proof that you can meet someone who's amazing and, you know, healthy relationships and all of that. And we were traveling back from a trip that we had taken and we had driven separately and I had a flat tire. We were almost home. I pulled over on the side of the interstate. It was about 5.30 on a Sunday, so still daylight. He pulled up behind me and, you know, stubborn guy that he was, he was like, baby, I don't, you know, I don't want to call AAA. Let's just, I can change the tire. I can get it done faster. And so I acquiesced against my better judgment, to, to be honest. And I'm standing on the side of the road, texting my daughter, who was 12 at the time, to tell her that we would be late. And he's digging in my trunk in between the two cars, trying to get the spare tire. And a driver who we later found out had both meth and alcohol in his system did not see our hazard lights and just crashed right into the back of Hugo's car and trapped him in between his car and my car. And you know, within 24 hours, the time it took for us to get to the hospital and try all of the life-saving things that we tried the life that just was exactly what I wanted, you know, felt like it got ripped away. And what I very quickly learned, even though I had a great therapist, thankfully, um, was that what I knew about grief really wasn't helpful. And most of it was outdated. And I, I don't want other people to have that experience. So, you know, fast forward to kind of doing all of that work on myself and figuring it out for myself, I decided this is what I want to do for a living. And that was, he died in August of 2016. So really since 2018, I've been coaching widowed moms and it's, it's a, a, a big passion for me, right. To help women not settle, um, when it feels like what they really wanted was taken away from them. And a huge part of that is conversations like this, right. Giving people valuable, accurate, helpful information about grief, because we're all going to have a grief experience, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's how I came to this work. Not really, not intentionally, right? But yeah, here we are. That's how I started becoming a stepmom coach. I, I mean, that's how I became one. Like I never wanted to be a stepmom. And then um, I became a stepmom and then everything goes sideways. Right. And then, then I kind of felt like I figured it out and I was like, okay, kind of like you, there's a lot of things that like, I wish I would have known or things that were outdated and like not helpful. Like, let me rewrite this story. Exactly. So you were married, ended in divorce. And then when you married Hugo, like, did he have kids also? Or were you a he, stepmom? He, he did. He okay. had a 17 year old who was not his biological son, but was the only dad that right. yeah. he had ever known. And so he really did raise him from the time he was in diapers. Um, so yes. Okay. And are you yeah. remarried now? I am not remarried now. I am partnered now. I honestly okay. don't know that I want to get married yeah. again, you know, um, but, <laughs> but we've been, yeah, we've been living together since 2021. Um, I kind of waited to start dating until I felt like I was in a really good place. And I felt like I didn't, it wasn't a need anymore. It just felt like a, a nice to have, but, but I created what the relationship with myself that I really wanted to have. Okay. So, yeah. And so, and my current partner has two children. Well, well, not really children anymore. The oldest is 22 and got married in December and moved out. And the youngest uh, just turned 18 and he's about to head off to college. And then oh, I have fun. a 20 year old and a 17 year old. So four okay. between us. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because this is a question that I know already that some moms are listening to. So Hugo passes away. Do you keep in contact with his son? Yes. Okay. Yes, because I'm yes. sure people, that's a, a and, big question, right? Like if something happens to my partner or if we end up splitting up, like, do I, do I not keep in contact? Is it weird? Is it not weird? What does that look like? 
what's going on? It was weird mm -hmm. I, I, in that it was, you know, we had only been married for three months. Like it was a, you know, we'd been together for a couple of years, but we'd really only been married for three months. And so we were just kind of, you know, finding that normalcy together. And also um, I had never met his ex-wife. Okay. And, you know, as one does, often we don't have the best things to say about our ex-spouses. And, and, and then the really interesting part was that we had not changed our insurance over. So his life insurance was actually still set to go to her. We yeah. thought that we had to wait until the annual enrollment period. We worked at the same company, long story short. So she and I, like our first interaction was in the intensive care unit, really. I mean, that was the first time we were like ever had a conversation and then navigating the service and navigating the insurance and navigating, taking care of Lance. And it was, I mean, I look back and I, I'm so impressed with both of us. Mm -hmm. I'm so impressed with her, honestly. Um, and the amount of just grace and kindness that she extended to me whenever we would be in the same space, um, with Lance, she would introduce me as Lance's other mom, like mom number two, like, you know, yeah. so, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, a wild ride in on many accounts, um, but the stepmom like part definitely part of it. Grief does weird things to you, like Indeed. either you know, right, like it just does weird things to people in general, right? Like you see siblings fighting over you know certain things or exposes fighting over certain things, and I can't even imagine being in the intensive care unit. And by the way, um, my husband, your ex husband, has passed away, and the insurance is still. I'm going to send yeah. you the check. Do you think you could give that to me? <laughs> like what awkward conversations and how like, it was. Yeah. Yeah. It so was, but also it was so healing mm -hmm. um, to have yeah. those conversations with her and to make that connection with her. I actually ended up later on. She hired me to be her coach as she was, <laughs> we I were both that. interested in life coaching. Yeah. It's the wildest thing Yeah, um, for sure. But yeah, it was an intense, strange you know, experience that I don't think anybody can really be fully prepared for. Yeah, I agree. So there are five stages of grief. Can you kind of talk us through that? What are they? Tell us all of the things. Okay. So I'm so glad you brought this up. I do a lot of, of, you know, grief education. Cause again, I love doing it. And I will ask people who's heard of the five stages of grief and almost everyone will raise their hand. They may not know what the five stages of grief are, but pretty much everyone has heard five stages of grief. And then I will ask, who has heard of any other theory of grief besides the five stages? And almost no hands go up. And this is why I love talking about it, because this is where I was too, right? Mm -hmm. I thought there were only, there, like, that was it, the five stages of grief. And what I later learned is that the five stages of grief, while very valuable, when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about them in 1969 by the way, which it's the year of 2024. Um, no one was having those conversations and she was studying hospice patients. So she was studying people who were not experiencing grief because they had lost someone or something they cared about, but they were experiencing the grief of coming to terms with their own terminal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And what she noticed anecdotally and then wrote about in a book called On Death and Dying was that people would first go through denial, then they would get angry, Mm -hmm. And then they would bargain and then they would get depressed and then they would accept. Mm -hmm. And then later she extended that work into a book on grief and grieving. But, and, and so again, very helpful at the time because nobody was talking about it, but she never meant and regretted later in life and, and wrote about it later in life. She never meant people to take her work and make it formulaic. Mm -hmm or prescriptive or linear. She never meant to imply that acceptance is a place. She never meant to say that, you know, once you feel a sense of acceptance, that grief is over. Mm -hmm. And, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, because the five stages of grief caught on in our popular culture, we have misused it. Mm -hmm. And, and we have kind of turned it into something that is, is almost weaponized. You know, when you're, when you're the one experiencing grief and you realize, oh, my experience doesn't actually look like this. It feels a lot like trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. So I see the value in what the five stages gave us back when nobody was having that conversation. Also, you know, grief and the study of grief has advanced tremendously in, in those years since. And there are other theories that I very much prefer. And I wish we could stop talking about the five stages as though it were the only 
idea about what grief could look like, because it just really doesn't represent the experience most of us are having. Yeah. And I think that the whole acceptance part, right? So, so for somebody that was multitasking and was like, wait, 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 can you tell me those five stages again? Can yeah. You just denial. Yep. Yeah. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But and, again, like yeah. my recommendation is throw that out. Yeah. Right. Throw that and out. It, what? it It's really, it's really not representative of what most people experience. Yeah. Because I think like I was going to say like at the, the end, like when you get to the acceptance part, then I'm healed, right? Of course I'm healed because I accept it. That is not at all what happens. What do you see happening? Yeah. I mean, I think acceptance is an act. It's, you know, something we do repeatedly. So I, I, the other thing I wish we were talking about more is, you know, primary loss versus secondary loss. So the primary Mm -hmm. loss being the, the main thing that you perceive as a loss, right? So in my case, my husband died. That felt like a loss to me. And then the secondary losses are all the losses that happen as a result of the primary loss. So for instance, when, you know, your child graduates from high school and he's not there, right. Or, you know, maybe they choose to get married and he's not there to walk them down the aisle or, you know, maybe you had a dream of what retirement was going to look like. And now that can't happen. And the loss of the dream that you had about what your retirement was going to look like is, is now a secondary loss. There are all of these secondary losses that will come following the primary loss. And so to say that you only accept the primary loss is to negate all of the challenges that you can't even predict yet. Right. Um, and so it's just like little griefs mm-hmm. that keep coming and keep coming. And so um, t- tending to that and taking care of yourself and and letting yourself feel how you feel about it is really what we want to be doing. And sometimes when we think of acceptance as one, you know, finite fixed place and a thing that we do one time, then we tend to judge ourselves. Oh, well, maybe I didn't do my grief right, or maybe I'm sliding backwards, or something's wrong with me, or I'm, you know, I'm I'm weak or something. And then we use that against ourselves when that is the exact opposite thing that we need, right? When we need to be tending and comforting and caring. To yeah. Ourselves. I completely hear you. I've lost people very close to me. And so, yeah. yeah, you get to that point where you're like, okay, they're gone. But then, yeah, there's that first holiday or the first birthday or you know, the wedding, like, you know, my mom and grandma mm-hmm. missed my wedding, like the birth of my daughter, like all of the things. Right. And so yeah. then you're like, I thought, it, cause I did the exact same thing. Like I thought I was better than this. I thought I was stronger than this, but I don't, I never heard of like the secondary losses. So I think that's, yeah, I was like, either. wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. And I, like I read once ride the waves of grief. Like sometimes there'll be like big crashing waves and then sometimes they'll just be gentle ones and just like grab a mm-hmm. surfboard and like hop on or put on mm-hmm. your life jacket and just like yeah. ride with them. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Yeah. So what theories about grief do you kind of like subscribe to or do you mm-hmm. kind of follow? My favorite is called the dual process model. And I love that one. Basically what it says is if you take all the things that we do in a day and divide them into two buckets after a loss, right? You have the grief related activities. So that would be the logistics of what has happened. That would be feeling the feelings of what had happened, right? Memories, like anything related to the actual loss, that's the grief related or loss oriented. And then the second bucket would be the restorative restoration activities, things that we do that are unrelated to the loss. So this can include getting outside, having, you know, fun with a friend, Netflix binges, like distracting ourselves from what has happened. And what the dual process model teaches is that healing can be found in the intentional oscillation back and forth between both buckets. And the reason I love that is because as a like recovering perfectionist um, and someone who you know, was socialized in a way that says that productivity equals value to some extent. Hey girl. Nice yeah, right. Hey girl. Hey. <laughs> <clears throat> I remember just thinking like, if somebody can give me the instruction manual uh, to grief, I'm just going to knock the crap out of it. Like I'm going to get an A in grief. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and just that, that like proving energy and, and, and when you fall into that trap, like I did, it can be really easy to then not take good care of yourself, not let, let yourself rest, make laughter and joy mean something they don't mean. I, I didn't love them enough, or, you know, I'm moving on too quickly or whatever. And so, and, and also I think just as women, we have a hard enough time prioritizing 
ourselves and, and pleasure and rest. Mm -hmm. And so dual process model says there's value in those things. We don't have to be thinking about our loss all the time. We don't have to feel every feeling, right? We, we, it is okay to laugh. It is okay to distract. It is okay to take good care and do other things. And we just want to find a balance. We don't want to avoid to the extent that, you know, that's not helpful. Um, but we also don't need to dive in and only stay there to the point that that's not helpful. So I love the dual process model. Okay. So for somebody that has dove in and they're just staying there, how, what would you say to them to help them like process, trust, like prioritize like mm -hmm. themselves, like while they're in the middle of grieving, maybe they don't yeah. know what dual processing is. So how would, how would you get them to like, Hey, come over here. It's okay. <laughs> come okay. on over to the other side. Yeah. Um, you know, I would think about like, you know, how sometimes your best ideas come to you in the shower mm -hmm. or like when you're on a walk, you're not really, you're not really trying to think about something. And yet you notice that there's an answer there for you. I think it's a, it's a similar experience to that where when we give ourselves permission to do things that aren't related to the, what feels like the problem we're trying to solve, sometimes that is the answer and it might not make sense why that happens, but we've usually had a lived experience when we know that it does. And it's the same kind of thing. So can I just, you know, when I look at the week ahead, where, where's the pleasure, where's the downtime, where's the distraction that I'm intentionally planning Right. Yeah. And, and when you do it that way, then when you actually get there, what is intended to be restorative can actually be restorative. Like how many times have we, you know, been on a social media scroll or, or a Netflix binge and it's not even rejuvenative because it wasn't planned. And the, the, like what's happening in the back of our mind is like, you shouldn't be doing this something, you know, you should be doing other things. You're lazy. Like we have this kind of narrative that doesn't give us permission to actually be present with the distraction or the thing that we're doing. And so planning it in advance, I think there's so much value in and oh getting gosh. in the habit of that. Yeah. I completely agree. Cause there have been times where I am doom scrolling and I know that I should not be doing it. And I'm like, there's the laundry that you could be doing. Yeah. You, know, you could be insert whatever it is. Like you should probably be productive. You know, I totally relate when you're like perfectionist and like yeah. productivity and all of that. Yeah. I've totally been there. Can we shift gears and talk about like the loss of a parent, like how to, yeah. navigate, like, how do we help children grieve for a parent that's gone? Mm -hmm. I think in huge part, it starts with, um, how we grieve, right. Mm -hmm. And how we, um, how we show them how we grieve. And because, you know, most of us have been taught that quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, right? Negative emotion is a problem. Or is really bad. Or is bad. It's something to avoid. It's contagious. It's, you know, happiness is the goal. Um, then that can make us weird. Totally weird. <laughs> when, when we're grieving, because we might then, you know, not want to show what's really going on for us in front of our kids. Um, we might say things, you know, that imply that strength is better than display of emotion or feeling feelings. We might isolate. <clears throat> and what I think could be more helpful is when we're honest in, in age appropriate ways, right? Like I'm not suggesting we tsunami whale, you know, all the time in front of our kids, but like, can we talk about how we are feeling so that it normalizes how they are feeling and that it normalizes like, of course we're sad and it's okay. However we feel. And it's also okay to laugh and to smile and we don't have to be strong and we can talk about it. And we don't shy away from sharing memories of the, the parent. We incorporate them into conversation. Um, you know, we don't, so many times I hear well-meaning people say their, say to their kids, well, now you need to be strong for mommy. You know, now you need to be, you need to be the man of the house and, oh, you know, let's not put pressure on our kids. And if we can also not put pressure on ourselves, I think that helps us not put pressure on our kids. So feeling feelings, doing it together, having conversations, opening doors of communication, all of those things can be so valuable. And then I also think it's, it's helpful to get resources that are age appropriate for your kids, right? Because every kid is going to have a different experience. First of all, every, every child will have had a different relationship with that parent, right? It's different child, even though it's the same parents, different child. So there's going to be a different relationship. Every child is, is a different human at a different developmental stage. And so understanding how different ages typically deal with grief can also really help. 
And there are some great resources out there. I love um, the Dougie Center. I'm always referring people to them. It's a center for grieving families and they're based in Portland. Their website has a ton of age appropriate information and resources that is so supportive for parents who are helping children. I it's love Dougie, D-O-U-G-Y dot org. Perfect. D-O-U-G-Y dot org. Mm -hmm. I love that you talk about how each kid's got a different relationship with that parent and certain things are age appropriate, right? Um, I also think it really depends on, like you said, how we deal with it as adults. And if we don't have the tools to navigate that, or, you know, if we've just kind of like stonewalled ourselves and like, we're going to be strong and to kind of like break that cycle and be like, okay, I need to show up in a better way for these kids. Can you kind of talk about how do I know if something is grief or it's just typical child behavior? Yeah. Um, and first, I, as you were saying that, I also think it's important to say this is like an oxygen mask on yourself first moment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And sometimes I know as moms, it, it for me at least, it was, okay, I just need to focus on the kids, right? Like they are my number one priority. I just need to take care of them. And it's so easy to put our own needs on the back burner. And if we r remind ourselves that, you know, this whole parenting thing that's in front of us and, and the whole grief experience that's in front of us is a marathon and not a sprint, we have to take good care of ourselves. And that is what allows us to take good care of, you know, our kids. And so, um, so just want to say that, but as far as what is grief and what is not grief, it's a question that gets asked all of the time, and it's really not a very useful question, which is usually what I try to help people understand because grief, especially when you're talking about the loss of a parent, is going to affect every aspect almost of the child's life. So there really is no way to parse out what is grief and what is you know typical developing stuff. Everything is colored through the lens of what has happened to them or us. And so I, I just don't find there's a lot of value in the effort of trying to figure out. It, it's more like, okay, this is what's happening. It doesn't matter why it's happening. It is what would be the, the useful next step to take to support the child. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how we label it because yeah. grief is just going to color all the things. Let me ask you this because you are a stepmom. So let's say that you've got a stepmom where their stepkids' mom has passed away. Mm -hmm. How would you, and let's say that it was not a good situation. Maybe there yeah. was like some addiction or maybe that was just like a high conflict situation because this is something that I see happen a lot, right? How do I help my stepkid grieve this woman that made our life hell? And right. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to show up and, you know, be supportive and be helpful. And it's really hard to put your emotions aside or your thoughts aside and mm -hmm. try to be there for some. So what advice would you so totally like throw you off or like give you a question? Like, out no, of I love, but like, I love how that. Would you help somebody navigate that? Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, I would say uh, your job is not to make them feel better, mm -hmm. right? Your job is to be with them no matter how they feel. And so often in grief, what we're trying to do because we've been taught that feelings are problems is we're seeing pain in other people and we're trying to change their pain. Mm -hmm. And if you've been on the receiving end of that, you know, it doesn't feel good when you are expressing what's going on for you and someone else is trying to minimize it or tell you to look on the bright side, or, you know, they loved you very much. They would want you to be happy. Like they're saying things because they're uncomfortable with your discomfort and they're trying to change how you feel. So if you can remind yourself that how that child feels is not a problem and it's definitely not something we're trying to fix and that it needs a witness and and then it gets easier, right? Because then you can just be there with them. It's like you're on the same side of the table with them instead of on opposing sides of the table, trying to talk them into a better place. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's first and foremost. Um, God, I wish we could just all, all do that, right? And then also none of what they say is personal. And sometimes what happens then is even when it was a super complicated relationship, they might glamorize the relationship in ways that don't actually reflect your understanding of what that person was like or how they were treated. 
um, they might insult you or, you know, tell you things like that, you know, I wish that you had died instead of them. Like, you know, some, sometimes these, these kinds of things happen and it's helpful just to remind ourselves that that has nothing to do with us, right? It is not a personal insult. It doesn't mean we've done anything wrong or aren't a good step parent. Um, it, it's just a reflection of, you know, what, what the child is going through. And sometimes I see this a lot when we think about if you were to line up all of the emotions that humans experience and and line them up in order of their desirability, right? With like joy, ecstasy at the top, and then powerlessness and despair at the bottom and line them up. Anger, guilt, blame, higher on the list than despair and powerlessness and grief. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we will resort, and this is not just kids, this is all of us, we will resort to, you know, blaming other people, blaming ourselves, right? Feeling angry. And we can kind of get stuck there. And there's a saying that I love that mad is the guardian of sad. Oh, yeah. And I find that to be very true for myself very sometimes. True. Yeah, if, yeah. If I let myself feel mad about something, usually the very next thing that I feel is sad. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, we're, we're watching them be really angry and and thinking that's a problem when sometimes it can be a way that they're protecting themselves from feeling sad. And so just knowing that I think can be helpful or they're blaming us or others again, as a, because it feels more powerful mm -hmm. than to just accept that this, this is the reality of what has happened and they were powerless to control it. It's a very scary thing for adults, you know, and children too. So I, those are some of the things that I think. Oh I my gosh. Love that you touched on the glamorization of the deceased person. Because I see that a lot. Like I can't, I can't compete because now she's a saint and all of the things. And, you know, we have to have a shrine to her and, and you're, oh my gosh, a hundred percent, right? Like I wish that you would have died instead of her, or, you know, if you would have let me go there one last time or whatever, right? Like yeah. we live like that just as humans take the step, anything out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then you've got a young child or a teenager or a young adult, somebody that isn't completely developmentally like pre prefrontal cortex isn't completely developed and then they just lash out I mean we do that as adults too right like I would be lying to you if I were to be like oh I've never said things like that or I've never felt things like that right mm -hmm. and it's hard in normal step family life to not think take things personally well my mom makes better lasagna than your yours or we have more fun baking with her right and then now she's gone. And then like, now you're the worst person because you're here and she's not and all of it. So thank you so much for just touching on the glamorization of like the person. It doesn't necessarily have to be their mom, anyone that could be deceased, like in your step family. Yeah. But I love that you said mad is the guardian of sad because yeah, you're right. Mad. Like there's so much anger. I mean, there's so much power in being angry or being mad, but it's hard to be sad because there's nothing that you can do about it, especially like on the scale of like desirability. I'm like, oh, that's a great way of putting it rather than like good to bad emotions, like mm -hmm. the desirability scale. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So speaking of parents being passed, like how would you talk to me through navigating like birthdays or holidays? Like if when they're gone, like now what mm -hmm. do we do? Right. Cause it's the yeah. elephant in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think giving people choice and having open conversation can be very helpful. Sometimes I, I will see, because, you know, I primarily work with, with widows who are, they're having these conversations with their kids. And sometimes what they want to do is very different than what the child or children want to do. And every kid might have their own opinion about how to deal with it and what to do. And so, you know, opening that conversation up, I think can, can be really helpful of, Hey, you know, this is coming up. Is there something that's important to you about how we handle that this day? What would feel really good to you? Um, ignoring it, maybe not the best policy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even though um, it might feel good for you as the step parent, right? Because I don't yeah. want to talk about her or do it. And it's like, it's not about you at this point. It, yeah. Yeah, totally. And the worst part of it is always the feelings. It, it's, mm -hmm. I, there's so much dread leading up to days that were special death anniversaries or birthdays or you know, Father's Day, Mother's Day, whatever it is, there's so much dread. And usually what we're dreading is we don't want to feel something. Mm -hmm. And so the more permission we can give ourselves to feel whatever we feel and let that be okay, right? The less we're trying to control how we feel on that day, which I control? do a lot. Really? 
Yeah, I know, right? Who would have thought? <laughs> I mean, who would, I, I don't try to control anything about my life. Ever, never. Um, ever, no. Um, but, you know, like I was just coaching uh, two people yesterday on sending their kids away to college, you mm-hmm. know, and not wanting to cry at the check-in, you know, why do we do that to ourselves? Why, what, how, what would change if we were just like, you know, it's however I feel is okay. And however they feel is okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to try to plan the perfect memorial so that nobody has feelings or avoid the conversation so that nobody has feelings, right? We can just give ourselves permission to feel how we feel without treating it as a problem that we got to solve. Then it gets easier, not easy easier. It's easier. Yeah. You get stronger. It's like a muscle that you learn to flex. And I like that you touch on just giving yourself permission. Cause you know, as a stepmom, if you just give yourself permission to like step back and just take a breath and be like, you know what, right now it's a little overwhelming for me because of whatever I'm going to go do X, Y, and Z. I'll be back in however long. If we just give ourselves permission to feel overwhelmed, to feel frustrated, to feel sad, to feel resentful that we're in the, we would break all of the cycles and it would be so much easier to move forward. And I think there would be a bigger dialogue step parents specifically about how it is really hard. This is a really hard role to navigate and then add in deaths and passings and like, yeah, how, how you play in real life is how you're going to play. Like when something big happens. So Mm -hmm. I like the idea of like, just Mm -hmm. give yourself permission to feel whatever it is. And there can be two things true at the same time, right? Like your step kid may be sad where you may feel ambivalent or indifferent. Like you guys mm-hmm. don't have to match your feelings. It's okay for everyone to process things and experience things differently. And just being comfortable in the uncomfortableness of just their sadness, which I think is so hard because it's an undesirable feeling. Yeah. I love what you just said though. Comfortable in the uncomfortable like that. Yeah. It's like the bane of like every step mom's existence, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the human existence more broadly speaking. Like, yeah. But yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. There's so much. Okay. So can you talk to me about what happens after grieving, like the post-traumatic growth? What is that? Mm. How do we, mm-hmm. like, what can we do with that? Yeah. Post-traumatic growth. It, like, I remember the first time I heard the term, it was like one of those record scratch moments where you're like, what, what, what did they say? And, you know, knew about post-traumatic stress disorder, but never heard about post-traumatic growth. So post-traumatic growth is actually a term that has been being used since the mid nineties. I didn't know about it till Hugo died, but there were some researchers, last names, uh, Tadeshi and Calhoun, and in the mid-90s, they were studying what happens after a quote-unquote traumatic event. At that time, we were thinking of trauma differently than we think about it now. We were thinking about it like big T, little t, certain events are traumatic, other events aren't. You know, We were thinking about it as very objective, and now we know that it's actually quite subjective. But what they thought before their work was that a traumatic event would happen and a person would basically have two options. Their level of wellness or life satisfaction would dip down and stay there. Or the best case scenario is that it would dip down and then bounce back to where it was before the trauma. And what they started noticing, and actually a good amount of their work was done on widows, they started noticing there was like this third category whose level of wellness or life satisfaction was dipping down, but it wasn't just bouncing back to where it was. It was actually bouncing forward and people were self-reporting higher levels of wellness and life satisfaction. And it wasn't in spite of the trauma, it was because of it, Oh, right? So they, it was basically them saying, okay, this thing happened and now I'm going to take this life experience and I'm going to make choices accordingly such that I'm living a life that's even more aligned with what I value and who I want to be. And so, you know, for some people that looks like a greater appreciation for life. For some people that looks like, you know, seeing that they're stronger than they thought they were. Um, It can encompass a lot of relationship changes. There's five domains. um, So, you know, you know, when you go through something serious, sometimes you realize, wow, this person that I thought would be there for me ghosted me. But this other person, right, came out of the woodwork or, you know, I'm really kind of not being as authentic as I want to be in the relationships that I have. I'm like holding on to this relationship just because I went to middle school with this person and it's not, 
yeah. not really the, I want to like right size this relationship. And, and when like the records, you know, scratches and something big happens, that sometimes is the opportunity that we have, which is to go, okay, wait a minute. Am I living the life that I want to live? Where am I out of alignment with what really matters to me? And I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to make some choices. And sometimes that means really big choices and people go on like me and change their entire career, you know? Um, and then sometimes that means small, but really significant choices like right-sizing relationships and maybe, you know, the way that you see your faith tradition changes for the better for you, um, so I love the idea of post-traumatic growth, not as something that is morally superior, not as something that we want to consider another to do or should in grief, but just to say, like, I get to be the one, no matter what happens to me, I get to be the one who always chooses what she wants to make it mean, right? I get to be the one who decides how I want to live my life, no matter what gets thrown at me. I don't have to be grateful for the loss right? I'm definitely not grateful that my husband died. And also I'm proud of the choices that I have made since he died. Mm -hmm. And, and that's post-traumatic growth. I think there's a lot to be said though, for understanding what you just said. Like, I'm not grateful that he passed, but I appreciate like the decisions that I've made. Like mm -hmm. there there's, you know, it's like those two can't both be true, but they are. Yes. I, I mean, sure didn't, didn't think that in the beginning though. I remember thinking, okay, I've got to figure out a way to be grateful for this. Like I thought I had like gr gratitude as like a superior concept in my mind, you know? And like, if I'm, if I'm going to be happy again, then I'm going to have to be grateful that this happened. And that is just nonsense. Yeah. Like that sounds so crazy to think, right? Like, oh, I have to be I grateful know. that he died so I could do all this. No, 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 no. Like, no. Yeah. yeah. Can you just talk about right-sizing relationships? Oh, sure. Uh, so yes, by that, that I happens a lot. And I see it a lot with people that I know, like in real life where I'm like, why do you hold on to these relationships? Yeah. I'm right. Serving. Yeah. At um, all. yeah. So really it just means kind of like to whatever extent you want to do it again, it, you, you know, could be just one relationship. That's really something that's you, you know, are not happy with and want to change. But when you look at the quality of your relationships, who are you in relationship with? How are you in relationship? Is the frequency of the communication that you have, you know, with people, the, the way that you want it, it, whose opinion are you putting higher than your own? Uh, you know, are you maintaining relationships out of a sense of obligation? You know, there's all kinds of ways to think about it, but it, it's really just looking at, we don't have to keep going through the same motions in the same relationships when we determine that that's not what we want anymore. And and sometimes that can be its own grief, mm -hmm. right? It can be the best thing that we do because it's what we want. And also it can be really hard um, to acknowledge that, a, you know, a relationship isn't what we had hoped it would be or what it used to be. And and maybe it's time to make some changes there. So okay. That is a perfect segue to a question that I was like, I want to ask her this, but like, how can I weave it in? So a lot of times stepmoms show up on the scene. They've never been married and they don't have kids before. I did this too, right? And then step family life happens and there's all of the things you, you have to deal with. Your step kids is mom. There's the custody schedule. There's all of these things. And then it's a weird dynamic. And it took me a long time to understand that I had to grieve the life that I thought that I was going to have. And so grief doesn't necessarily come from a death per se of a person or a pet or you know, somebody close to you, but it could be like grief of, or like the death of like an idea of what you thought your life was going to look like. Can you talk us through that a little bit and like how to navigate that? Because I see that a lot. Like, you know, I don't even know, I do have a kid of my own now. So I've got two step kids and my own daughter, but I hear from someone coaching or in my community that say, well, I don't even know if I want to add kids to this chaos or this life. Like I thought that I would have kids by this point, but now I'm like, I don't think so. And I'm so burnt out with how much resentment I have or the lack of control or the frustration mm -hmm. or all of the things like my life is not turned out what I thought that it would be. And I'm kind of angry that I've put myself in this or that I was duped into this or that I couldn't, have, I can't believe I was so stupid to like fall mm -hmm. into this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think my favorite definition of grief is the natural human response to a perceived loss. Mm, okay. 
Now, when, when the clients that I'm working with is mostly in bereavement, which is someone died. Okay. So yeah. that's a subset of grief, but the natural human response to a perceived loss. I mean, think about how broad that is just exactly what you just said, which is, okay, this, I envisioned this part of my life would go this way and it went that way. And it feels like a loss to me. Mm -hmm. It does not matter if it feels like a loss to other people. It feels like a loss to you. Right. And so therefore we want to tend to that, that loss, right? We, you get, you get to have feelings about that. You're not wrong for having feelings about that. You're not supposed to be just grateful for the way that it went. Right. And, and then ignore what, what is hurting in, inside. Um, so I think if we can just start by giving, by naming it and calling it grief, that even of it by itself is so helpful right? This is grief. I, I thought I was going to be in this job. I was in this one. I have a friend who is a coach. She's actually coaches people going through breakups and she couldn't have a baby and, you know, went through all the grief around not being able to have a baby, sold herself on the life of not having children and like got, got herself to the point where she was actually really excited to not have children and, you know, had decided that was actually going to be great and then got pregnant. Mm -hmm. The complicated roller coaster of that, right? <laughs> of then like, ah, oh, man, like I, I wanted a baby and then I went through that grief and then I decided I didn't want a baby and then I got written and then I went through that grief and 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 then, you know, the, the potential judgment for what other people might think about her being sad about being pregnant. And um, anyway, yeah. but that's still grief. You expected it to go one way, it went another and it feels like a loss. And so can we take care of ourselves and let ourselves feel how we feel about it? Um, you know, validate that it, that it is a valid experience. And then that, that right there, if we could just do that, let ourselves feel how we feel about it, then it, we wouldn't be stuffing it down, right? It wouldn't build up. We wouldn't be adding energy to the emotion because we're trying to get away from it or resist it or tell ourselves it shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And then it can flow through and, you know, the, the waves are, smaller, if you will. And then we can get on about choosing the next thing and preparing for the next grief, which will inevitably happen because we're humans. Right. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you figure out one way and I, I like it because then you can just like add different tools to your toolbox and then you kind of just like build up this repertoire yeah. of your entire life. Not that I appreciate yeah. going through grief all of the time, but you, it gets easier. It doesn't get easy. It gets easier. Like you said, Yeah. you have tools, you have different resources. Going back to what you said, which I think was just such a great analogy of like the surfing, you know, or, or imagining the waves. It's like the waves keep coming and we just yeah. get better at surfing them. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like the waves get less necessarily, right? But we just get better at adjusting um, and we learn tools that work for us. You know, tapping for me is probably my favorite emotional processing tool. I I don't know where I'd be without that tool. I love it, you know? So we just figure out what works for us. Do you do tapping yourself or do you go to appointments? Both, both. Um, I discovered it and did it a long time by myself and started helping my kids with it by myself. And then I decided I wanted to become certified and I, I started going through training and part of that training was that you had to get coached by a, you know, another person. And I ended up paying someone to coach me and she was so amazing. I was like, forget this. I don't even want to certify. I just want to hire her. And so I work with her on a weekly basis. I bring her in to work with my clients. I, I tap most days of the week by myself in addition to working with a coach. So I love that. Yeah. yeah. Having the tools in your toolbox. And both like of my, te well, my 20 year old and my 17 year old both actually work with her weekly now too. Yeah. yeah. Look at it's, you breaking you know, cycles. Uh, hey, right. And, and it doesn't just have to be tapping. It's whatever works for you, but mm -hmm. you know, it is, it is, how do I create safety in my nervous system or my body and let myself feel how I feel? Yeah. The safety is a huge piece, right? Yeah. Cause that's really what we all want at the very basic level. Like everyone wants to feel safe, loved, like they belong. Yeah. And yeah. Oh my gosh. Completely hear you on that. Thank you so much. This episode has been so good. So I'm super excited to like put it out, but where can everyone find you? Yeah, for sure. Coaching with Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A.com is my website. I was concerned people wouldn't be able to spell St. Germain. So <laughs> I totally kept it basic, amazing. but um, no, I, if people love podcasts, then I definitely invite them to come listen to the widowed mom podcast. And I realize that they might not be widows or, you know, necessarily moms, but if they want to learn about grief, 
that's what, that's my jam, right? Grief and post-traumatic growth. That's what the podcast is all about. And for sure, if they know anyone who might benefit from listening, because maybe they're going through that life experience, I would love it if they shared the podcast. There's like 270 episodes now. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Yeah. I've been doing it for a while and I love it. I, yeah, podcast is so easy. I, easy. I love it too. I'm like, this is it's so much easier than I thought. And I'm like, I should have started so much sooner. And I'm how sure cool is it that we like, we can help people who we've never even met. Yeah. Like what? I know. And it's like so anyone cool. can listen. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Or like you said, like you can share it to somebody else. It's like, oh, right. I'm going through this. you need to listen to Kristen's, Kristen's episode. Yes, like so 75. Yeah. So true. Like, so great. So I will link your website and your podcast you. and the doggy.org. So that way people can get yes. it. Yeah. Resources they there. also have a great podcast too called oh. Grief Out Loud. Grief oh, out loud. Okay. And, and it's, so if anybody's interested in, you know, I mean, they cover all sorts of grief stuff, but I love their podcast too. Okay. I will definitely link that as well in the right podcast. I don't forget. Thank you so much. This has been such a great recording. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking time to listen to this week's episode. If anything was helpful or resonated with you, please share it on social media and tag me. I'm just at Alicia Crosco. And if you could leave a five-star rating and review while you're at it, that would also be really helpful. And if you find yourself struggling with your stepmom journey and you want a little bit more support without the hefty price tag of coaching, you might want to check out the Stepmom Side community, which is my own private community for stepmoms, where you get to connect with other stepmoms around the world and myself, where I hold weekly office hours and monthly group coaching. It's kind of like you have your own personal coach in your own back pocket, again, without that hefty price tag. See you next week.